It has been said, every movie that matters in the last 50 years owes some inspiration to Citizen Kane. Such praise is remarkable when you consider at the time it was made, it was ignored by the press, resented by the Hollywood establishment, and very nearly never released at all. RKO was offered $800,000, practically the film's entire budget, if they would only burn the negative. Now times have changed. But I don't think any of us, horse included, we're thinking that we were making a film that was going to be thought of 50 years later as maybe the greatest film ever made. It's certainly one of the top few. I don't think any of us thought that. I'd say including Arson. Welcome home, Mr. King, from 467 employees of the New York Inquirer. Here he comes! Today, Citizen Kane is the standard by which all other films are measured. No other movie has had a more profound influence on generations of filmmakers. Ah! No other production broke so many cinematic barriers. I think we shall have to tell him now. Yes. No other film is universally regarded as the greatest movie of all time. Reflections on Citizen Kane a 50th anniversary special. The brilliance of Citizen Kane begins and ends with its architect, Orson Welles. A one-time child prodigy, Welles had already made an indelible mark on stage and radio. In 1938, his broadcast of H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds was so authentic, it created a nationwide panic. Having come from radio, uh, where sound was uh, was terribly important, the sound effects, backgrounds, music and all, and uh, he had a great feel and great instinct for it, so he was very, very particular about uh, the sound and the sound effects and how the whole soundtrack was treated. Along with John Houseman, he had been a co-founder of the highly regarded Mercury Theatre Troupe. He had a well-earned reputation as an innovative and charismatic leader who surrounded himself with talented young performers and bullied them into reaching their potential. He loved creativity, you see, and that was the thing. As long as you were creating, he was happy, Greg was happy, you were happy, everybody was happy. And of course, there were no brass around, no PA people, no publicity, nothing. Literally, it was a closed set. And I mean, I was astonished later on to see all the people that... Uh, wandered in and out but nobody nobody interfered with us we were a tight little family and we could risk anything that way anything by the time he walked into hollywood in 1939 the 24 year old wells was considered by many a genius well if somebody as unique as that comes along who was able to give a performance like he could give and also direct like he could do and probably write like he could do you have a kind of a total, you know, intellect. That's a very unique individual. Good evening, Mr. Kane. There is a man. He signed a contract with RKO head George Schaefer for two films. At a time when the studios virtually controlled people's lives, the agreement was astounding. It gave Wells almost total creative freedom over every aspect of production. He could produce, write, direct, or star in any of his films. It was a contract all of Hollywood envied, made all the more remarkable by the fact he was only 24 years old and making his first feature film. Wells was a genius. And I heard once a definition of talent, that talent is doing easily what other people find difficult. And genius is doing easily what talent finds difficult. And he just, he, he did it in that movie. After briefly considering a spy thriller, Wells settled on an enigmatic newspaper publisher as his subject for Citizen Kane. The choice of William Randolph Hearst as the subject matter was a very difficult choice for Orson Welles in the 1940s. Uh, there was less of the icon smashing. That's why he went into politics. It seems we weren't enough. He wanted all the voters to love him, too. He had an idea to tell the story of the man's life through the eyes of those who knew him. True to form, 
he began casting about for the kind of people who could carry out his vision. When he went to work on the film, he told the people working around him, Greg Tolan and a number of the others, I keep, I keep mentioning Tolan's name, but there's so many other great people who work with him, to do things they were told they could never do. He worked with only the best. He started on the screenplay with Herman Mankiewicz, one of the great screenwriters in Hollywood history, a multi-academy award winner. Mankiewicz had been a frequent house guest of William Randolph Hearst, the newspaper tycoon upon whose life Citizen Kane would be loosely based. So to look at Citizen Kane, it was a real interesting statement about the power of the press, the power of the media, you know, how one man could mold, you know, you want a war, we'll start it for you, you know, that kind of attitude, uh, that, that Hearst really had that kind of power. Having broken his leg in New Mexico, Mankiewicz wrote the entire first draft while lying on his back. Running roughly 250 pages, it was called simply American. And there's some dispute as to who did what on the, uh, on the screenplay. I know a lot of Mankiewicz's supporters say it was really almost entirely written by Mankiewicz. I don't know. But the screenplay that Herman Mankiewicz and Orson Welles jointly wrote still stands as one of the great achievements in film writing. Pretty old. How old? 22 in August. That's a ripe old age. What do you do? Well, Wells supervised numerous rewrites of the original script and wrote several key scenes himself. In many places, he replaced paragraphs of dialogue with one line or a simple look. Well, Mother always thought... <laughs> she always talked about grand opera for me, imagine. But my voice isn't that kind. It's just... Well, you know what mothers are like. Yes. Up until that time, Hollywood movies had always followed a straight narrative story. In Citizen Kane, Wells did something radical. He started at the end. The most obvious convention that Wells broke in that film was the uh, straight conventional narrative story. And I think that really is, uh, is wonderful because they begin at the end, they go back to the beginning, somehow in the middle, <laughs> you know, and then go back to the beginning again and wind up at the end somehow. And it's really quite, quite extraordinary. In order to take you through all those time shifts, he had to employ a great deal of film techniques that in many cases were rarely used at the time. For the cast, Orson Welles turned to the members of his Mercury Theater troupe. Many of them had never before appeared on film. They included That's Joseph right. Cotton in the role of Kane's best friend, Jed Leland. Agnes Moorhead as his childhood mother. Ray Collins as his political rival, Jim Geddes. Erskine Sanford, the bewildered newspaper editor. And Paul Stewart as Raymond, the cynical butler. Dorothy Comingorb, a veteran of Three Stooges movies, played Kane's modestly talented second wife. For the part of Emily Norton, his first wife, Wells auditioned a little-known stage and radio actress. Uh, I was coming down in costume to do the test, and I guess... I should have been surprised that the leading man was actually there to test with me. I didn't know that that was an unusual sort of thing. But Orson always did the indigenous thing, not the thing that is usually done. Just prior to the screen test, Wells broke out in a cold sweat. It wasn't until later that she realized she was not the only actor making her first appearance before the cameras. Among the neophytes was Wells himself. There's a call I want you to make with me, child. Much of his apprehension may have come from the studio heads who were constantly looking over his shoulder. Knowing full well the powerful enemies his movie would make, Wells closely guarded his production. When RKO executives arrived on set, he distracted them with magic tricks. Once he even started an impromptu softball game. Wells shot certain scenes in advance, telling the studio they were merely screen tests. Uh, among the tests, incidentally, were the opening uh, uh, seen in the projection room with the March of Time people. That was one supposed test. And then when you go through the, the skylight uh, to, uh, to Susan in the club and being interviewed by, by the reporter, that was another one made as a, quote, test. Well, after about three or four of these, they decided that they might as well give him the green light, go ahead and make his film. Contrary to popular belief, the cinematic techniques utilized in Citizen Kane were not entirely new. What was revolutionary, however, was how Wells and his team combined them in a way unlike anything that had ever been seen before. Nothing had come through with the, with the, with the look and the feeling of the dynamics and the unusual aspects that this film had. This was completely extraordinary. The low angles, the high contrast, shadowy lighting. Um, but 
he took it a whole another step. Declaration of Principles. He pioneered the use of angles in spatial relationships between characters. A powerful figure looked down at the camera. Weaker ones looked up at it. Distances told everything. Orson had a great feeling that uh, the proportion and distance and angles between people told the whole story. Uh, he said you should be able to see the film without one word of dialogue and understand at least the relationships between the people. In order to create the commanding presence of Charles Foster Kane, Wells and cinematographer Greg Tolan took some unusual steps. They were on their hands and knees on the floor with a hatchet, uh, literally hacking out the wooden floor and then digging out the dirt beneath it so that they could put the camera not just at floor level, they kind of buried it like you would in the sand uh, so that the lens was actually right at the floor level. You don't care about anything except you. You just want to persuade people that you love them so much that they ought to love you back. Only you want love on your own terms. Another result of Nothing such extreme angles was that the ceiling room. became part of the shot. At that time, it was common for sets not to have ceilings. That was where the microphones and lights were usually hidden. And agrees to abandon all claims. Which there. means we're bust. All right. Well, out of cash. All right. Another technique Wells right. exploited fully was the use of deep focus photography. Tolan designed special camera lenses that enabled action deep within a scene to remain in focus. With this technique, Wells was able to fill the entire screen with information. In consideration thereof, that As I understand, there were great meetings between Toland and Wells in which this was worked out as they should be before the film was made, so that this use of very deep focus, which was not necessarily revolutionary, but I would say evolutionary, it was done better and more completely on that film than any film ever done before. That particularly impressed me. Wells used lighting techniques that were more appropriate for the theater than for film. Harnessing light to create a mood, the director instantly communicated what he wanted in the scene. He employed unconventional methods, often leaving the principal speaker shrouded in shadows, while everyone else remained brightly lit. He used smoke quite extensively, and he had these great shafts of the sort of high contrast lighting in these this kind of Notre Dame shafts of light coming out of the projection rooms. A new film developed by Kodak enabled Wells to shoot in less light and with greater contrast. However, the technology had not advanced sufficiently to allow them to shoot in low light levels, such as night scenes. Instead, Wells used painted mats to create a background in many of his shots. First of all, you couldn't shoot at night with the moonlight and the, all that kind of thing with the, with the emulsions that were available at the time. So. So he knew what he wanted to, to see as an image and, and used the effects in that way. Wells combined models with live action. Often a carefully planned dissolve or wipe provided a transition between them. By overlapping the audio, he created a seamless bridge from one scene to the next. The soundtrack of Citizen Kane is extraordinary. The overlapping dialogue and uh, the use of um, distancing and, and voices and the, uh, the way people uh, speak to each other is very much like applying radio technique to, to, to film. He's still Uncle John. He's still a well-meaning fathead who's running a pack of high-pressure crooks around his administration. This whole oil scandal... He happens to be the president, Charles, not you. That's a mistake that will be corrected one of these days. You, Mr. Bernstein, sent Junior the most incredible atrocity yesterday, Charles. I simply In the can't breakfast scene, nursery. we observe the chilling relationship between Kane and his wife. It is a mastery of film editing technique. Overlapping dialogue and a visual transition device create the passage of a ten-year period in their lives. And though the scene lasts barely two minutes, it plays beautifully. That scene with Wells is pure Wells. The overlapping is so well done. It's never done at the expense of the story. It never becomes a gimmick. It, 
It propels the scenes forward. It gives them such terrific pace. It just doesn't get any better than that. News on the mark! Even more complex was the newsreel sequence near the beginning of the film. To be able to, to uh, uh, shoot something in the way, let's say the March of Time sequence is shot, where uh, he's uh, part of a, found, a, a foundation of a, of a building, they're laying the foundation stone, and uh, he's, he's in a high top hat and long coat, and they're, and they're putting some mortar on the stone, and then some falls on his coat, and there's a jump cut. Uh, as if the film breaks and they put it back together, uh, the way newsreels were at the time. And it was so simple and so obvious to, to go ahead and use that technique. In order to give the piece its authentic look, film editor Robert Wise ran the film through cheesecloth filled with sand. Uh, making the film that Orson shot to simulate newsreels of the time, making it look like it uh, was part of that whole fabric of the real newsreel. We had to take our film and degrade it. We were running through cheesecloth on a rewind with sand and everything, scratch it up. Other, other people would come in our department and say, what in the world are you guys doing? Many other contributions to the production of Citizen Kane were exceptional as well. The transformation over 50 years in the life of Charles Foster Kane was a milestone in cinematography makeup. Maurice Seidemann used many of his own concoctions to make complex physical transitions. A total of 72 different face pieces, 16 chins alone, were used to age the actor. Wells spent up to four hours a day in makeup, sometimes beginning as early as 3 a.m. Mr. Carter, I'm going to live right here in your office as long as I have to, and I'm Carter. Uh, live here? That's right, Carter. Yes. The movie combines its drama with moments of unbridled humor, much of it provided by Carter, the befuddled newspaper editor. Mr. Carter, that's one of the things that's going to have to be changed around here. In this the news scene, goes on actor Erskine Sanford sustained a nervous breakdown from doing so many retakes. Excuse me? Miss Kane, it's impossible. We... Bernard Herrmann not only composed an Oscar-nominated film score, he had to write music for the movie's grand opera scenes as well. In order to make Susan Alexander's voice sound sufficiently weak, he had to force the soprano who dubbed in her voice to sing above her range. Even while the movie was still in production, the Hearst Publishing Empire tried to have it stopped. The reason for their concern was obvious. The film painted an unflattering picture of a media baron whose similarities to William Randolph Hearst were hard to miss. My thought is it is very much about Hearst, very much. It has to be with Xanadu, San Simeon, the newspaper, the wife, the mistress, it's Hearst. It's Hearst. Xanadu, Kane's fictional estate, reminded people of the Hearst family mansion, San Simeon. Like Kane, Hearst himself had a well-publicized affair with a mistress, whose career he shamelessly promoted. What's more, both women shared the same fascination with jigsaw puzzles. For both Wells and RKO Pictures, the thinly disguised affinity to the powerful Hearst was a tremendous risk. RKO at the time was on the financial brink. Fearing an anti-Hollywood backlash, MGM's Louis B. Mayer offered to reimburse the film's entire budget if they would only destroy it. However, the resourceful Wells had already previewed the film to so many influential opinion makers, it was impossible to hold back. Still, there was a price. The very mention of Citizen Kane or any other RKO picture was banned from every one of Hearst's publications. His newspaper critic, Luella Parsons, made it a personal crusade to prevent the release of the film. And the movie was pulled from its premiere at Radio City Music Hall because of John D. Rockefeller's friendship with Hearst. Reaction from Hollywood was not any better. Resentful of Wells' notoriety, the picture was booed at the Academy Awards ceremony. Nominated for nine Oscars, it won only one for Best Screenplay, a credit Wells shared with Mankiewicz. Now in complete control! Orson Welles went on to lead a controversial career. No After Citizen Kane, ago, his contract was rewritten. Though he later directed other respected films like The Magnificent Ambersons and Journey into Fear, 
and performed a highly regarded role in The Third Man, he had lost his freedom to be a maverick. Still, his legacy survives. Wells was a beacon in a way, and uh, uh, was someone you could keep looking towards, and uh, uh, someone whose, whose work constantly surprised you and enriched you. His excesses came from an excess of passionate longing to do the work that he loved to do. I think, uh, without question, Orson is poster genius of anybody I've come across in the business. He was, he was fascinating, stimulating, uh, aggravating. To play the lead of a film and give a complete, completely realized performance and at the same time direct the entire ensemble, which is what Wells did, on that point alone, the film stands as one of the greatest of all time. Wells' films were always a cut somehow or other above most others. It was always big, but somehow it was through the eye of a microscope. It was so detailed, which I loved. It's mind-boggling that he wrote, produced, acted, and directed it at 26 years old. His use of the camera is breathtaking. Regarded by many as the greatest film of all time, Citizen Kane remains the crowning achievement in a brilliant career. It influenced a generation of filmmakers it changed an art form forever. Charles Foster Kane would have been proud.